Canada is known for its snowy mountains, untouched forests, pristine lakes, friendly, helpful people, eh? And that delicious maple syrup. Now they get to add something else to the list, the world's oldest water. Back in 2016, researchers drilled down 1.9 miles and found an ancient pool of water at Kidmine, Ontario. The water was believed to be at least 2 billion years old. Hmm, not fresh water. The water was found bubbling up in caverns deep underground inside the 3 million square miles of the Canadian Shield, one of the world's largest geological continental shields. The area endures very little plate tectonic activity, possibly explaining how the water remained untouched for so long. Scientists and researchers analyzed the water and found dissolved gases of helium, argon, xenon, and neon, untouched by any outside source. There were even traces of microbes dating back billions of years. This was a stunning find for science that allowed us to gaze back in time at a lost world. If life-supporting water can be found miles below the Earth, it could be possible to find the same thing on other planets, like Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter's moons as well. Point Nemo is the furthest point from land on Earth, officially called the Oceanic Point of Inaccessibility, kind of like my parking space. It's so far from land that the closest humans to it are usually astronauts. The International Space Station orbits the Earth from around 250 miles away, while the closest populated spot to Point Nemo on Earth is more than 1,670 miles in all directions. Since its real title is a bit long, it was nicknamed Point Nemo after Captain Nemo from Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Nemo means no one in Latin, which suits this area perfectly because there's no people around. The Crooked Forest is found in Grafina, Poland. It's a grove of 400 unusually curved pine trees that were planted around the 1930s. They bend northwards at a sharp 90-degree angle from the tree's base, but then remarkably turn back to grow straight up into the sky. Some of the curves reach out 3 to 9 feet sideways, but the trees are healthy and many grow to nearly 50 feet tall. These crooked pines are surrounded by a larger forest of straight-growing pines. There's no explanation as to why they're bent the way they are. The theories for this strange development range from weather conditions to human intervention, but no one knows for sure. The Hamza River is one of the longest and widest rivers in the world, and it sits right underneath the Amazon River itself. At a depth of 2.5 miles, this river flows a little more than a trickle compared to the great river above it. The push of the Amazon River's water into the Atlantic is around 35 million gallons per second, while the Hamza only manages 1 million gallons per second. <laughs> Either way, there's no choice but to go with the flow. Around the same length as the Amazon itself, 3,700 miles, it's the width that stunned the science world. It's 125 to 250 miles wide, compared to the Amazon's width of about one half mile to 60 miles wide. The Cave of Crystals was discovered in 2000 when miners drained water from a zinc mine in Chihuahua, Mexico. Um, the state, not the dog. What scientists found was an enchanting cave filled with colossal gypsum crystals that were larger than 33 feet and over 3 feet wide. They were so pure that scientists were unable to work out how old they were. But researchers believe they discovered a 50,000-year-old sample of bacteria inside one of the crystals. Also known as the River of Five Colors, Caño Cristales is one of the most amazing natural wonders in all of Colombia. The area is filled with waterfalls, pools, and caverns, but the river itself is the true wonder. Every year, between June and November, the river hypnotizes spectators with amazing yellows, greens, blues, blacks, and red shades to create a liquid rainbow. A red plant that grows in the riverbed is the main cause of this unique phenomenon. Other colors come from the black rocks, green algae, clear water, and yellow sand, producing a pearly effect. The colors change every year because of the plant's growth from rainfall, temperature, and sunlight. During the rest of the year, the riverbed appears in a dull green hue. Scientists in Hawaii discovered that red algae were making sounds in the waters around coral reefs. The noise was believed to come from the loud snapping shrimp, until researchers put the sound and presence of algae together and started monitoring the bubbles. 
As the algae use photosynthesis for food, they produce tiny bubbles that collect on their surfaces. When the bubbles separate off the plant, they make a ping or a popping sound. Reefs can be smothered and suffocate if they're covered by too many algae. Discovering that photosynthesis makes a sound could be useful for the reef's preservation. The algae could provide early warnings for scientists, so they can stop these vulnerable areas from being overrun. After heavy rains and seismic activity hit Kenya's Great Rift Valley in March 2018, a vast chasm expanded across the land. The rift measured quite a few miles long and was over 50 feet wide in some parts. Essentially, it was tearing Africa in two. Africa sits on two tectonic plates, the Nubian and the Somali plate. Deep below Earth's surface, driven by the active mantle, the plates are being pulled apart. This creates the huge, extraordinary rifts we see on the surface. It will take millions of years for the large continent to actually separate into two pieces. I won't be around then. But when it does, it'll also create a new ocean basin. The Eucalyptus deglupta thrive in the tropical forests of Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and the Philippines. And they're like something straight out of a video game or fantasy movie. Growing up to an enormous height of 250 feet in its native environment, this one-of-a-kind tree has bark that displays green, bright blue, orange, purple, and red streaks as it ages, kinda like me. As strips of bark fall away, the tree's colors change, and the bright green inner bark is revealed. Off of the beautiful island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, there's a spectacular view that has to be seen to believe. You'll need to hop on a plane to get a bird's-eye view, though. What looks like an underwater waterfall is actually sand from the shores being pushed off of a high coastal shelf by ocean currents. It falls all the way into the deep dark depths of the ocean on the southernmost tip of the island. Most of the ocean waters around the island are only 26 to 490 feet deep, but this deep plunge drops down a few miles, creating the illusion of a waterfall. This oceanic shelf didn't exist a few million years ago. But seafloor spreading has created this quite recently. The walking trees of the Amazon are one of the most unique and puzzling ways plants move to get to the perfect spot for everything they need. These trees walk by allowing the new roots to replace the older ones while searching for more sunlight in the dense forest. As the roots fix themselves into the new soil, the tree bends towards the new roots, leaving the old roots to slowly rise. Traveling to a new place with better sunlight and more solid ground can take a couple of years. This is because they only move around 8 tenths of an inch a day, or around 65 feet a year. Now you can just imagine this going on in your front yard. You plant the tree here, and next year, it's all the way over there. Ah uh, well. Down in southern Costa Rica, 300 stone petrospheres are dotted all over the forest. Some weigh as much as a bowling ball, while others can be up to 15 tons. Their purpose and how they were made so long ago are lost to us. Discovered in the 1930s, a lot of them were removed and transported around the world. It wasn't until the 1970s that we began to preserve and protect these stones. While the stones are mostly a mystery, archaeologists know they're made from granodiorite rock, similar to granite. If they were carved by a civilization, their near-perfect shape must have been made by chiseling away with small stones. Ethiopia's Danakil Depression is an environment that looks like it belongs on another planet. Filled with lava pools, bright neon-colored hot springs, and vast salt flats, it's also the contender for the hottest year-round temperature of 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Poisonous gases fill the area with hot springs filled with acid. Worse, it only receives up to 8 inches of annual rainfall. It's also one of the lowest places on the planet, at 410 feet below sea level. No wonder it's one of the most inhospitable places on the planet. Hey, sounds great. No crowds. Let's go. If you've ever driven over the Rocky Mountains, you've probably seen road signs for the Continental Divide, the backbone of North America. All watersheds to the west of it run into the Pacific Ocean, and everything on its eastern slope goes straight into the Atlantic. There's just one creek in Wyoming that couldn't choose one side and drains into both oceans at the same time. Two Ocean Creek begins its journey high up in the Teton Range. The snow-capped peaks provide the perfect backdrop as the creek starts its descent. 
winding its way through alpine meadows and dense forests. As the creek continues its course, it gets to the Two Ocean Pass. This is the geographical crossroads where the creek splits into two branches, the Atlantic Creek and Pacific Creek. The Pacific Creek goes westward and becomes part of the larger Snake River watershed, bringing its waters to the Snake River, which eventually merges with the Columbia River and, finally, reaches the Pacific Ocean. The Atlantic Creek heads eastward and flows into the Yellowstone, Missouri, and Mississippi rivers and eventually empties into the Gulf of Mexico. If you connect the two creeks' watersheds on a map, you'll get a single blue line between Oregon and Louisiana. Explorers struggling to find the Northwest Passage between the two oceans never knew they could have used the creek. They would just have to use really tiny boats. Some scientists believe that cutthroat trout had better luck in that way. They managed to migrate from the Snake River to Yellowstone River, most likely using the Two Ocean Creek. Technically, fish can travel over 6,000 miles to cover the whole distance from sea to shining sea in fresh water. The creek could be just perfect for that journey. There are hiking trails in Grand Teton National Park that lead to Two Ocean Pass. If you feel adventurous enough, you can stand at the literal crossroads of the continent and see the beginning of two aquatic journeys. Lonar Lake in India popped up literally out of nowhere around 52,000 years ago. Newer data says it could be much older, probably over 500,000 years. At first, scientists were sure that the lake was in an ancient crater of a long extinct volcano. But then, Geologists made a detailed analysis of the soil and water and found out that Lunar Lake has a space origin. The minerals found in its soil are similar to those found in moon rocks brought to Earth during the Apollo program. The lake is an impact crater left by a huge meteorite, which was almost six times heavier than the Empire State Building. The impact was so strong that the volcanic rock melted and turned into glass. In 2020, the lake, which was already unusual enough, suddenly turned pink. It wasn't a part of an early Barbie movie marketing campaign. The detailed analysis showed that the water contained an increased level of unique microbes. They accumulate on the surface and emit some pink pigment. After a while, the microbes settled to the bottom and the lake became transparent again. Flamingos that got their food from the lake also got to taste some of the microbes and became an even brighter shade of pink than usual. One of the most famous sites of Yellowstone National Park is the Grand Prismatic Spring. It's one of the largest springs in the world, and it's inspired people who have seen it since at least the 19th century. Back then, a group of trappers mentioned an indigo blue lake boiling like a huge cauldron. Decades later, expeditions came to the spring to study it better and explain its unusual appearance. But because the spring at its widest point is longer than an American football field, they had to build a special vessel and travel far from the shore. The scientists traveling in the boat never wore life vests. They knew those would be useless if the boat tipped over. The water in the middle of the spring is of near boiling temperature and those vibrant colors are the result of extreme organisms living in the hot water. The temperature changes as you travel away from the center. Different species that don't mind the heat have settled in different parts of the pool, giving it its famous diverse pigments. Back in the early 20th century, someone got the interesting idea to try to irrigate a part of Nevada's Black Rock Desert. They drilled a well and found lots of water, but it was near boiling temperature. The water was clearly not good for agriculture, so the human-made geyser was left abandoned. Over the decades, it slowly turned into an impressive cone of calcium carbonate deposits. Then, in 1964, a geothermic energy company drilled another well close to the first one. The water they had found was of the same temperature. This time, it wasn't hot enough for their needs to produce energy, so they decided to cap the well and leave. But water managed to get up and out, and it completely dried up the first geyser. The second one, which got the name Fly Geyser, is still flowing burning hot water rich in minerals. The cone is multicolored and looks like it's not from this planet, thanks to the algae living in it, which love the heat. 
Every summer, Caño Cristales in Colombia turns into a liquid rainbow, or the River of Five Colors. At this time, and until the end of fall, the conditions are just right for the riverbed to turn bright red, yellow, green, blue, and black. We owe this beauty to certain aquatic plants growing in the river, a special type of river weed. During the wet season, the river moves fast and the sun cannot get to these plants. During the dry season, there isn't enough water to feed them, so the time in between the seasons has the perfect conditions for this colorful show. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. At some point, the number of tourists who wanted to see it became so huge that scientists got concerned it could be bad for this hotspot of biodiversity. The area is home to rare species of animals, birds, and plants. Now, there are ecotourism trails and strict opening hours. In August 2014, a man in Tunisia was going back home from the north after doing his business. It was a hot summer evening and he was dreaming about water when suddenly it popped up right in front of him. There was a whole lake in the middle of the desert and the man was pretty sure it hadn't been there several days before. The new body of water got the nickname Mysterious Lake and actually became a great mystery. Hundreds of people came here to swim in the clear, cool water. The lake became a popular place, but a few days later, the water turned dark green. The locals didn't care about this and continued to bathe in the lake. But when scientists and geologists arrived at the place, they announced that the water was dangerous to swim in. The lake was stagnating. It didn't refresh itself from underground streams, and the rains didn't feed it either. That's why the water became moldy and dirty. The lake contained algae and a lot of harmful bacteria dangerous to the human body. Scientists also found out that the land in this region had phosphate deposits. This substance can decay. But even that didn't stop people from bathing in the lake in the middle of the desert. How it got there remains a mystery. Some experts think that heavy rains have filled a hole in the ground with water. Another, more popular theory says that an earthquake had formed the lake. The seismic activity must have torn the Earth's crust above the water table, and then underground springs had filled the crevice. So, in theory, the lake could drain back out one day, just as suddenly as it had appeared. When we think of active volcanoes, one region comes to mind – the Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean. Three quarters of Earth's volcanoes sit within this belt. Compare the area to Australia, which doesn't have any volcanic activity. The old continent of Europe is also calm. Or at least, we like to think so. Can you guess what the most active volcano in Europe is? If you thought of Mount Etna on the island of Sicily in Italy, you were right. The volcano has erupted about 200 times and has been far from sleeping in recent decades. The last time this happened was in August 2023. The highest mountain in the Mediterranean is half a billion years old. But in Iceland, there is a much younger volcano. It sprang into action on the 10th of July 2023. In the afternoon, three fissures appeared in the ground on a peninsula in the southwest of the island. This was at a base of a small mountain peak. Its name means little ram in the local language. The volcano spewed molten lava high into the air. There were also gas plumes in the area. But the scientific community wasn't surprised by the event. They already knew about the volcanic area that stretches between the cities of Reykjavik and Keflavik. Its name is hard to pronounce. Hey, I want to buy a vowel. It had already erupted during the previous two summers. This activity came after eight centuries of dormancy. In the days leading up to the latest eruption, seismologists, the scientists who study earthquakes, recorded over 12,000 tremors. When the ground opened up in July, the fissures were over a mile and a half long. The following morning, two of them closed. All the lava was now coming out of the last fissure. It grew into an elongated cone, the simplest shape of volcano we are all familiar with. The lava soon filled a large crater. It grew almost 100 feet tall during the first week, and it is still growing. On the night when the eruption started, lava spread out in all directions. Its cinders set ablaze the dry moss in the vicinity. Local authorities closed off the surrounding area. 
there were toxic gases from the volcanoes and smoke from the burning moss. Firefighters flocked to the area. After a week, they proclaimed the area safe. Visitors soon came to witness the birth of Europe's youngest volcano. This form of tourism is quite developed in Iceland. People come from all over the world to watch active volcanoes. The land of fire and ice is home to more than 130 volcanoes. Some 30 of them are active. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Is volcano tourism safe? In Iceland, it is. The country's authorities research and constantly monitor all of the hotspots. The island is dotted with several dozen seismic stations. These help researchers accurately predict future eruptions. And emergency services are accustomed to these sorts of events. They can quickly cordon off danger zones. This is what happened in 2010. A volcano in the south of the island, the name of which everyone struggled to pronounce, erupted. It spewed out a plume of steam and ash that was 7 miles high. Uh, this wasn't a fun time to be an air traveler. Winds carried the enormous plume southeast toward northern Europe. Many countries closed their airspace for several days for safety reasons. The volcano erupted in March, but the Earth was shaking from January the same year. So seismologists knew that an eruption was approaching. When it comes to the continent's youngest volcano, the tourist infrastructure is already there. Visitors can leave their cars at a designated parking lot. Then they go on a five-hour-long trek. This leads to a viewing deck. Tourists are so close to the epicenter that they can feel the heat haze from the crater. The site is the most impressive at nighttime. Safety is never a concern. Scientists regularly chart out hazard maps that outline the borders of lava fields. This way, visitors who stick by the rules are never in harm's way. More than a week after the eruption started, a section of the crater collapsed. Lava flowed downhill west of the volcano. This majestic smoldering hot river is slow-moving lava. Scientists categorize it as an a-a type. The term is Hawaiian. It describes basaltic lava that has a rough and brittle surface. The flow is composed of broken lava blocks that are called clinkers. They fall off as the substance flows. This reveals red-hot areas. The cooler sections of lava are gray and black in color. When it moves forward, it produces a distinctive sound like shattering glass. Nearly a month after the eruption of the new volcano, we got aerial footage of an interesting phenomenon. A tornado formed directly over the lava flow. This occurs due to the high temperatures in the area. When the conditions are right, a column of heated air can easily turn into a mini tornado. Scientists observed a similar event happen during the 2018 eruption of Mount Kilauea in Hawaii. The lava fields of Europe's second largest island tell the story of the creation of Iceland. It sits above the place where the North American and Eurasian plates meet each other. Tectonic plates are huge, rocky chunks of Earth's most outer layer. There are roughly 20 of them. They rest on a partially molten layer of rock. All the lava we see on the surface starts its journey here. You could say that these plates float on molten rock. Their boundaries are unstable. So when two plates grind past each other, they release tremendous amounts of energy. The formation of volcanoes is one result. These are places where the molten rock travels upward to the surface. Iceland began to form some 60 million years ago. The tectonic plates under the ocean drifted apart. Enough lava piled up on the surface to create solid ground. This ancient rock is under the waves today. As new lava reaches the surface and cools down, it pushes the old rock away from the center of the island. That's why the oldest parts of Iceland aren't 60, but only 16 million years old. The country's active lava fields are young in geological terms. Some of them are under 1,000 years old. Scientists consider the island a hot spot for volcanoes, pun intended. Nearly a third of the basaltic lava that reaches the Earth's surface in recorded history came from Icelandic eruptions. Fissure swarms, like the ones before the 2023 eruption, cover 30% of the Nordic country. For this reason, only a quarter of the island is inhabited. Norse Vikings were the first people to settle in Iceland at the beginning of the 10th century. Nature threw them a loud welcoming party. Just a few years after their arrival, 
They witnessed one of the greatest volcanic eruptions in history. Vikings came from a region without volcanoes, so they had no clue as to what was going on. Today, Icelanders are used to such events. This is good because their homeland is entering a new era of volcanic activity. Volcanologists suspect that recent events are an introduction to decades of more frequent eruptions. The peninsula that is home to Earth's youngest volcano is just 17 miles southwest of Iceland's capital city. It's been dormant for a long time. Present-day eruptions there are a reminder that the natural processes that created Iceland are still ongoing. Recently, scientists discovered that there's a historical link between volcanic eruptions in the north of Europe and glaciers. Our planet went through at least five major ice ages. These were exceptionally lengthy periods when the average temperature on Earth dropped. The result was the expansion of ice sheets across northern Europe and North America. The last ice age ended some 10,000 years ago. Researchers are still trying to fully understand how these glacial periods affected volcanic activity. They suspect that the sheer weight of all that ice disrupts the flow of magma underground. When glaciers retreat, the pressure is lifted. This makes it easier for lava to flow upward to the surface where it bursts. The Amazon River travels through nine South American countries at a length of over 4,000 miles. Still, it's impossible to cross it by a bridge. With the river being the main highway, traveling through this dense forest and so few areas populated around the river, there's just no reason to have one. The river can rise up to 30 feet, and the river crossings that were only 3 miles wide can expand to over 30 miles in just a few short weeks in certain spots, making a bridge nearly impossible to build here. In New Zealand, in the coastal town of Mauraki, there are huge spherical boulders. Some rocks are 6.5 feet tall and weigh about 7 tons, as much as 10 cows. Ooh, there's a 10-cow boulder! Maori legend has it that these rocks are from the remains of the goods from a large shipwreck that happened hundreds of years ago. From a more scientific perspective, it's sand and gravel combined to form these giant boulders. Waves and winds give them a smooth, round appearance over time. The whole process might take millions of years. Indonesia's Kaiwan Ijen volcano is famous for a stunning turquoise-colored lake sitting at the top of the peak, but don't dip in, it's an acid lake. But its scariest part is the sulfuric gas is leaking out when lava flows freely, reaching temperatures hotter than 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. When those gases come in contact with the air, they combust into a spectacular electric blue flame. That's why the volcano has blue lava. The island of Surtsey, south of Iceland, was formed over 50 years ago by a volcanic eruption. It all began back in 1963, when a powerful volcanic eruption created one of the youngest islands on the planet. All sorts of bacteria, fungi, and molds began taking over the island, leading to numerous other animals finding their way here, like seals and birds. Birds and ocean waves deposited seeds all over the island. Sadly, the island's getting smaller now because of water and wind erosion. Located off the coast of Brazil, there's an island called… I'm a bit rusty on my Portuguese, so here it is on the screen. It looks perfectly untouched and pristine. Bad news? Dangerous snakes overrun it completely, so take a doctor with you in case you want to go there. Over 4,000 of the golden lancehead vipers inhabit this island. These 3-foot-long snakes are among the most venomous in the entire world. Yeah, I think I'll skip that. Landing down under, you can see the Opera House, Uluru, lots of kangaroos, and catch the strangest wave of the world, Wave Rock in Western Australia. It's not made of water, but stone. It can be up to 50 feet tall and almost 300 feet long. It's especially incredible after rains in winter, when the Western Australian wildflowers fill up the entire landscape. In Atlanta, there's a world of Coca-Cola Museum. The formula for the secret recipe is in a large security vault, heavily guarded at all times. Only a handful of people can get through those vault doors. Since its creation in 1886, the company has kept it a secret for only the most honest employees. In 2006, a former worker tried to sell the formula to Pepsi, only for Pepsi to call the police and inform Coca-Cola. The polka dot legs is a must for anyone who is in British Columbia. After the summer's scorching heat evaporates the lake's water, 
it leaves behind yellow, blue, and green water spots. These pools are full of all sorts of minerals, like sodium, calcium, and magnesium sulfates, that get concentrated in the pools. You can't get too close or even dip your feet into them. A fence protects the entire lake with a sign about how culturally and ecologically sensitive the area is. In Death Valley, California, there's a mystery of the sailing stones. Since the early 1900s, the mystery of how all these stones were seemingly moving by themselves across the desert floor baffled everyone. Some believe that the rocks move by thin pieces of ice around the stones pushed by winds after winter. No one ever saw any of these rocks moving until 2014. Scientists set time-lapse recorders, and the footage showed the rocks sliding along the ground over time. The marble caves in Chile, located in the beautiful area of Patagonia, formed from over 6,000 years of waves wearing down the rocks. The crystal blue walls reflect the vibrant turquoise water, making it perfect for kayaking. Walking in Chestnut Ridge Park in New York, one can see an eternal flame. What makes this one stand out, though, is it's underneath a waterfall. Occasionally, the flame will go out for short periods, but it will light up again. Sometimes it's thanks to certain hikers along the way. If you ever stop your car on a magnetic hill in New Brunswick, Canada, you'll see the car might start rolling backwards up the hill all by itself. While it looks like it's moving the wrong way, this is just an illusion. There are several hills like this all around the world. What looks like an incline is the opposite, all because there's no horizon for perspective. The brightest bioluminescent bay in the world, called Puerto Mosquito, is located off the coast of Puerto Rico. The bay is named for the pirate Roberto Cofrisi and his small boat El Mosquito, not after those annoying insects. During the summer months, you'll have glassy water at night with millions of tiny microorganisms bumping into each other and emitting blue light. The Chocolate Hills in the Philippines is a group of unusually shaped hills located in the middle of the island of Bohol in the Philippines. There are 1,000 to 2,000 discovered so far. They have nothing to do with chocolate at all, but they resemble the color after the dry season, when the grass turns from green to brown. In the northeastern part of Thailand, 466 miles away from Bangkok, is a 75-million-year-old rock formation sticking right out of the mountains. Their shapes look just like a pod of whales swimming together. No wonder this place is called Three Whale Rocks. Millions of years ago, this area was just a desert, but this land has changed quite dramatically during this time. These sandstone mountains were lifted up by plate tectonics, that's the shifting of the crust layers, called lithosphere, and erosion by the Mekong River, resulting in the strangely shaped rock formations we see today. Salar de Uni in Bolivia is the world's largest salt flat. At 4,050 square miles in size, it's twice as large as Grand Canyon National Park. After winter has passed, the Salt Lake is transformed into a beautiful giant sky-reflecting mirror between September and May. With salt all the way to the horizon, it creates an illusion of endlessness. The thin layer of water left over from ice melting creates a shimmering effect of the sky, making it one of the best places to visit in the world. The Catambo River in Venezuela might be the stormiest place in the world, with nearly 300 storm days a year. The lightning storms are so consistent, and they're predicted three months in advance. During the wet season in October, you might see 30 lightning flashes in a single minute. At sunset, strong winds flow around the three surrounding mountains, forming storm clouds over the water. When the water droplets of humid air collide with ice crystals from the cold air, the static charges cause a lightning storm that happens nearly every night. Off the southern tip of Japan lies the Yanaguni Formation. Archaeologists believe that the monument belongs to a fabled Pacific civilization, like Atlantis, that vanished beneath the waves thousands of years ago. If it's truly a lost civilization, or just nature having a little fun, this is the site to dive into. Features inside the structure resemble stonework, like castles, temples, and a stadium, connected by roads and what seems to be large walls all the way around. There are even marks in the stone that appear to show quarry work, faded faces, and rocks sculpted into animal shapes. Some scientists believe that the symmetry of the stones is not as straight as reported. It appears solid rock, rather than carved blocks, weathered down by all the water over many years. 
Splitvice Lakes National Park in Croatia is an interconnected chain of waterfalls, the tallest being 230 feet, and underground water channels, creating natural dams and lakes in such a picturesque environment. Found in the deep woodlands surrounded by meadows brimming with wildflowers, brown bears, gray wolves, lynx, deer, and plenty of rare bird species for bird watchers call these 115 square miles of the National Park home. Now, you probably won't be surprised to hear that the water coming out of your pipes doesn't simply travel from a nearby river. In most cases, it has to go through a lengthy process before it's safe for you to drink or use it when you shower. But there's a part of the scientific community that has some concerns regarding how we treat this water before it's good enough for human consumption. You see, there are countries that are still using substances in these water treatments, which might not be the best thing for our DNA. The culprit in this debate seems to be colloidal silver. This is a mineral that's been used in medicine for a long time because it can get rid of some germs. However, it may do more harm than good. Also, there isn't a lot of evidence that it actually works to disinfect the water. And now, researchers are warning that there's a risk that it could actually cause damage to the DNA. The research looked at previous studies where the effects of silver, silver nitrate, and silver nanoparticles have been measured. And while none of the studies alone are definitive, the researchers think that there's a chance that silver-treated water could damage our DNA. Now, official guidelines for drinking water quality don't currently include a value for silver in water. But they do suggest that a very low concentration could be tolerated without risk to health. The bottom line? We need more research to determine if people who drink water treated with silver have evidence of DNA damage. Until then, maybe we should stick to other ways of treating contaminated water just to be on the safe side. Now, hold on a minute. What's DNA anyway? I'd be asking that myself, too, if I were you. Let's talk about the real OG of molecular biology, deoxyribonucleic acid, or as we like to use easier acronyms, DNA. You might have heard that it's the building block of life, and that's true. DNA is like the ultimate instruction manual for all living things, from the tiniest microbe to the biggest elephant, and even me. But DNA is more than just a set of instructions. It's also the ultimate family heirloom, passed down from generation to generation, like your granddad's antique pocket watch. And just like the pocket watch, DNA has been around for a long time, dating back to the earliest life on Earth. Now, let's get into the nitty-gritty of what makes DNA so complex. It's made up of smaller elements that fit together like puzzle pieces. And when those puzzle pieces are arranged in a specific order, they can create everything from the color of your eyes to the size of your feet. Mm, I must have gotten more of that one. But how does it all work? How do we get information from these tiny puzzle pieces? Well, that's a bit of a mystery that scientists have been unraveling for decades. But one thing we do know is that DNA is a true team player. Every cell in a multicellular organization has a full set of DNA. The interesting part is that on an average day, our precious strands of genetic code can get pretty shaken up. A single cell can suffer up to 10,000 mishaps in its chromosomes within just 24 hours. But don't worry. Most of these little accidents get fixed up good as new, like a handyman with duct tape. However, some of this damage can result in permanent errors, also known as mutations or rearrangements, that can lead to some not-so-fun conditions in the human body. In fact, some studies suggest that DNA can get damaged by some of the most surprising things, like salt, for instance. Turns out that if we could technically sprinkle too much salt on your DNA, it could cause some serious damage. But don't worry, it's not all doom and gloom. As soon as the salt level gets lowered, those breaks start getting repaired. The only thing is, scientists are not exactly sure where these breaks are happening or what kind they are. And speaking of salty environments, there's a tiny microbe varmint called Halobacterium that lives in the Dead Sea and can teach us a lot about biotechnology and even life on other planets. That's because this little critter is quite the overachiever. In fact, halobacteria may hold the key to protecting astronauts on a mission to Mars from one of their greatest threats, space radiation. This can be harmful to the DNA in astronaut cells, 
potentially causing illnesses. But Halobacterium appears to be a master at repairing damaged DNA, and scientists want to learn from it. The researchers at the University of Maryland have conducted a series of experiments to test the limits of Halobacterium's power of self-repair using cutting-edge genetic techniques. Even after having their DNA completely fragmented, these little organisms are able to reassemble their entire chromosome and put it back into working order in mere hours. But why is Halobacterium such a tenacious survivor? Well, it turns out that it naturally lives in some rather inhospitable places, like ultra-salty bodies of water, such as the Dead Sea. In this area, most sea life would quickly shrivel up and fade away. But Halobacterium has evolved to cope with this salty lifestyle, and this could explain why it's so good at surviving radiation and other types of damage. In some experiments, the researchers exposed halobacterium cells to beams of intense UV radiation, which would have completely destroyed most microbes. Yet 80% of the halobacterium cells survived and went on living and reproducing just fine. In other experiments, they used a vacuum chamber to expose cells of halobacterium to a space-like environment, and the tiny cells became trapped inside salt crystals, which protected them from additional damage. Some scientists even claim to have found living cells of halobacterium encased in salt deposits that are more than 250 million years old. If true, this could have profound implications for the hunt for microbial life on Mars, given the data from the Mars Explorer rovers Spirit and Opportunity that suggest the Martian surface once had pools of salty water. Now, if you think about it this way, sure, salt and salt water in particular can damage DNA. But it can also help us understand more about how we can survive in harsh environments. There's still a lot we don't understand about human DNA, that's for sure. But did you know that you and I share a whopping 99.9% .9 of our DNA? We're almost genetic twinsies. I mean, think about it. You might have a dashing smile or a gorgeous head of hair, while I might have the most adorable dimples or the ability to recite every line from my favorite TV show. It's true. But at the end of the day, we're all made up of the same basic building blocks. It's that 0.1% of DNA that sets us apart and what makes life interesting. We also might have more in common with a cabbage than we'd like to think. Turns out that our DNA is 50% the same as that leafy green veggie. But don't worry, it's not like you're going to start sprouting leaves or anything. Actually, it's pretty cool to think about how every living thing on Earth evolved from the same ancestor over 4 billion years ago. And that ancestor was probably just a tiny single-celled organism with a coil of DNA. From there, it evolved into everything, from teeny tiny bacteria to humans with trillions of cells. Now, how about our closest animal relatives? Well, that award goes to chimpanzees and bonobos. Recent studies have shown that bonobos share just as much of our DNA as their chimp counterparts. But here's the kicker. Despite sharing about 99% of our DNA with these primates, we humans still act and look a lot different from them. Well, some of us. The researchers who sequenced the bonobo genome found some small yet intriguing differences in the DNA of the three species. These differences might just be the key to unlocking the mystery of why these wonderful creatures don't behave or look like us, despite being such close relatives. Actually, I have a cousin who acts pretty much like that. Imagine that it's the year 2025, and our planet has completely changed. Rising sea levels, extreme weather, and the ocean becoming more and more acidic are just some of the problems people have been dealing with for years. But in one of the world's largest coastal cities, the situation has become too serious. It was a sunny day in June when a massive earthquake shook the city to its core. The ground beneath people's feet heaved and shook, and buildings swayed dangerously. People ran through the streets in panic, trying to find safety. But as soon as the ground settled, the inhabitants of the city realized the real danger. A wall of water, almost 100 feet high, was rushing toward the city propelled by the force of the earthquake. The tsunami hit the city with unimaginable force. Entire neighborhoods were wiped out and thousands of people lost their lives. But here's where things get interesting. 
in the aftermath of the disaster, the city's authorities realized that they couldn't just rebuild the city as it was before. They needed to be better prepared for the next potential disaster. And so they came up with an incredibly ambitious project to build an underwater city. The goal was to create a self-sufficient, sustainable city beneath the ocean's surface that could withstand any natural disaster. The underwater city would be powered by renewable energy, using tidal power and underwater solar panels. It would be designed to withstand extreme weather and would have its own emergency response systems. The project attracted some of the world's top scientists, engineers, and architects. They worked tirelessly to design the city and carefully considered every aspect of the project. The underwater city would have everything that a typical city had, from schools and hospitals to stores and restaurants. There would be underwater farms where fish and other marine creatures could grow. The city would even have its transportation system, advanced submarines and underwater tunnels connecting different parts of the city. The project became a shining beacon of hope for people. It showed that even in the face of disaster, we could come together to create something amazing. But as time went on, the project no longer seemed so perfect. The cost of the project turned out to be higher than planned. There were also concerns about how long such a project would exist. After all, the ocean is very unpredictable. And still, the team of scientists and engineers never gave up. After years of trial and error, they finally created the perfect underwater city. A marvel of engineering a self-contained ecosystem that could sustain people indefinitely. The buildings were constructed from a material that could withstand the immense pressure at the bottom of the ocean. And the city itself was powered by a network of advanced hydroelectric turbines. It wasn't long before the first wave of colonists arrived at the underwater city. There were different people in this group, and each of them had their own reasons for choosing to live in this new world beneath the waves. Some were adventurers seeking a new world to explore while others were hoping to escape natural disasters raging on dry land. But despite their differences, all these people shared a common goal, to build a new society, one that was in harmony with the natural world. The underwater city flourished and new discoveries were made every day. The colonists developed new technologies and ways to tame the power of the ocean. They learned to farm the sea and started cultivating underwater gardens that provided them with a steady food supply. But living underwater was challenging. People felt isolated and even claustrophobic. The situation came to a head when a group of activists started to protest against the city's expansion plans. They argued that the underwater city was a threat to the environment it was meant to protect and that the colonists should focus on reducing their impact on the delicate underwater life. The protests sparked a heated debate among the colonists. Some of them argued that the survival of the city depended on its growth and expansion. Others claimed that the city needed to prioritize the protection of the environment above all else. In the end, a compromise was reached. The city would continue to expand, but the main priority would be sustainability and a responsible attitude to nature. The colonists would do their best to reduce their impact on the environment by using new technologies and following strict conservation rules. And they would also remember the importance of protecting the ocean and its fragile ecosystem. Years went by, and the underwater city continued to thrive. New generations of colonists were born, and they grew up in a world entirely different from the one their ancestors had known. They never saw the world on the surface, but appreciated the beauty and complexity of the underwater world they called home. And as the years passed, the city became a symbol of hope for a world struggling with the devastating effects of climate change. It showed that despite all difficulties, people could come together to create a better world. It is a reminder that the future is not set in stone and that we can build it sustainably and in harmony with the natural world. This region between Florida and the Bahamas is a famous place for studying various marine life. However, there's a mysterious phenomenon that happens here each year, the reasons for which scientists have yet to figure out. At times, People can see these white clouds appearing on the surface of the water. In technical terms, this occurrence is called a whiting event. With the information they have so far, scientists believe that the white patches may contain particles that are rich in carbon. The Bahama Islands do sit on a big platform of carbon, which stays hidden under the water. Another suggested theory for these unusual clouds 
is that maybe they're caused by blooms of tiny plants in the water. Scientists have even tried to use pictures taken from above by NASA to at least try to understand the movement of these water vapors. They've figured out that the size of the white patches seems to change with the seasons, with the biggest patches happening from March to May and October to December. The average size of a white patch is about 0.9 square miles. On a clear day, satellite pictures show about 24 patches. Other studies show that these events happen more often in places with considerable amounts of sediments at the bottom of the ocean. It's also possible that some ocean conditions make dirt and minerals float in the water. However, from 2011 to 2015, the patches in the ocean suddenly became almost four times larger. But by 2019, they had shrunk back down. It made scientists believe that there might be a 10-year cycle of sorts happening here, but they're not sure what causes it. They've also noticed a connection between the ocean's pH, salinity, winds, and currents. But for now, the data doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not the only secret Earth's oceans keep from us. Have you ever wondered about the deepest part of the ocean? It's known as the Mariana Trench, and it's believed to be around 6.8 miles deep, making it five times deeper than the Grand Canyon. The trench was first studied in 1875 with the help of a weighted rope. And in 2012, a Canadian film director reached its bottom using the Deep Sea Challenger submersible vessel. The Mariana Trench is home to some of the most bizarre creatures on the planet, like the Dumbo octopus, sea cucumber, and goblin shark. The trench takes its name from the nearby Mariana Islands, named in honor of Spanish Queen Mariana of Austria. It may be the deepest part of the ocean these days, but there's a lot we still don't know about the depths of our planet's waters. One such intriguing phenomenon is called phantom bottoms. In the 1940s, when sonar became standard equipment, ships and submarines started to detect unexpected signals from areas where no movement should technically exist. It turned out that these signals were coming from a layer consisting of jellyfish, shrimp, and other deep sea creatures. They rise to the surface at night to feed. Interestingly, these creatures move in a calculated manner, grouping together by species. It's still a mystery to scientists how they managed to do that and why. It was once believed that animals only grouped this way to avoid predators, but the reasons behind the formation of these fake seabeds remain unknown. Recently, the scientific community has acknowledged the existence of a fifth ocean, called the Southern Ocean. This ocean is bordered by three of the four original oceans and encircles Antarctica and the lower hemisphere, with its borders touching Australia, Southern Africa, and South America. It's a unique ocean, attracting attention and sparking curiosity with its secrets and the creatures it might hold. Rumors of a monstrous creature in these waters have been circulating for some time, and recent research has provided video evidence of strange blob-like fish. The creatures were identified as the sea cucumber with the nickname the headless chicken monster. Although this species has been known since the late 1800s, there's very little information about it, including its count, behavior, and reproductive habits. There are also areas in the world where the ocean literally sparkles. It's not because of the water per se, but because of numerous creatures that have the ability to emit light, known as bioluminescence. This is pretty common among aquatic creatures, with three quarters of all underwater life being capable of this. Bioluminescence can be found anywhere, from the surface to deep within the sea, even as deep as 2.5 miles. These creatures use light for various purposes. For example, for communicating with their own species, attracting prey, or scaring predators away. The science behind bioluminescence involves the use of three chemicals, luciferin, luciferase, and oxygen. This process was first discovered by a French biologist named Raphael Dubois in 1887. If you want to know the difference between real bioluminescence and artificially created light, 
Look for neon blue, green, or red sparkles spread over a large area in the ocean. This can create a captivating and magical effect, much like glitter or stars in the sky. And it's often because of squid, small crustaceans, and algae found in shallow waters. Have you ever heard a strange noise in the middle of the night? Now imagine that, but in the middle of the ocean! There are a few bizarre sounds that have been heard and recorded, like the bloop and Julia. Most experts think they come from big things, like icebergs scraping the ocean floor. But what if that's not the answer? In 1997, scientists were listening to underwater volcano noises in the Pacific using underwater microphones called hydrophones. One day, they heard a very loud and strange sound that was different from anything they had heard before. They called the sound the bloop. They couldn't figure out what was making this sound and thought it could be coming from a secret underwater mission, ship engines, whales, or an unknown sea creature. Years went by, and researchers continued to try and find the source of the bloop by putting hydrophones closer to Antarctica. In 2005, they finally discovered that the bloop was caused by icebergs breaking off glaciers and falling into the ocean. This phenomenon is called an ice quake. With Earth's overall temperature rising each year, ice quakes are happening more often, causing glaciers to crack and melt into the ocean. Then, on March 1, 1999, a loud noise was again heard underwater in the Pacific. The U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration thought it was probably an iceberg breaking, too. But the sound was different. This led some people to think the noise came from a sea monster named Julia. Some thought it was a new unknown species, while others believed it was a known creature, like a whale or a giant squid. Some even thought it could be a prehistoric animal. To this day, there's no proof that any of these theories are true. Then there's a story of an island that was swallowed whole by the ocean. It was called Bermeja, and it was a tiny and uninhabited island located at the northwest of the Yucatan Peninsula. Just a century ago, it was known to be located in the Gulf of Mexico, but now it's vanished, leaving everyone puzzled. In the past, Bermeja was frequently depicted on maps created by Spanish explorers during the 16th and 17th centuries. Although its location and name varied slightly, no one ever doubted it existed. However, starting from the 18th century, the island's presence on maps started to fade until it finally disappeared completely. So, what could have happened to it? Three official investigations were conducted in 2009 with the help of the most advanced technology. But Bermeja remained a mystery. Could it be possible that the island never existed? and was simply a fabrication created by early explorers to deceive their rivals? Some people believe that countries made maps with inaccuracies to prevent their enemies from using them. Bermeja could have been one of such fake islands. Other scientists disagree. They claim that there are documents with precise descriptions of Bermeja's existence. They firmly believe the island did exist, but in a different location. Whale watching is a popular bucket list item, but getting too close to these gorgeous sea creatures isn't the best idea, especially if you don't want to kick the bucket too early. Whales are generally curious and friendly giants, but they can be unpredictable when you cross their personal borders. First of all, they are huge, and one wrong move on their side could flip over your boat or seriously hurt you. Second, they are wild animals, and like any other wild animals, they can carry certain infections they could transfer to you if you get into direct contact. Plus, they have strong parental instincts, so if you approach their young by accident, they might think you want to take them away and will act accordingly. It is only safe to observe whales from the sea when you're accompanied by an experienced expert, both for your own good and for the good of the whale. Now, sometimes whales and dolphins strand themselves on the shore, for reasons scientists still can't explain. Quite recently, over 200 whales have been found on a remote beach in Tasmania, Australia. A rescue team rushed to the location to save the whales, half of which were still alive. 
the rescue operation was really complex due to the remote location. The locals were trying to help the whales, covering them with blankets and pouring buckets of water on them to keep them alive. This mutual effort of regular people and professional rescuers helped save around 100 whales. As to why this happened, one theory says the stranded whales might have had a leader who had some problems with orientation and took the whole pod to the wrong place. The Australian box jellyfish looks just like any other jellyfish you've probably met in the sea. But don't let these creatures deceive you. They're considered the most venomous marine animals. Box jellyfish got its name because it does look a lot like a box. Unlike other kinds of jellyfish that float with the current rather than swim, this creature can reach a decent speed and choose its own direction. And here comes the scariest part. It has tentacles covered with tiny darts loaded with poison. Mm. People and animals that get unlucky enough to have a rendezvous with those tentacles face some pretty scary and sometimes even fatal consequences in just a matter of minutes. Before you decide to cancel your vacation by the ocean, you should know that only a few out of the 50 species of box jellyfish have venom that is lethal to humans. Woo. There are some not-so-dangerous species living in warm coastal waters worldwide, and the lethal ones reside in the Indo-Pacific region and northern Australia. Good day, mate! Hmm? A blue-ringed octopus likes to pretend its only outstanding feature is the psychedelic color, but it can quickly and easily take away your life. This cute-looking sea monster likes to spend its time in the soft, sandy bottom or shallow tide pools and coral reefs. It normally hides in underwater crevices among shells or debris. If you somehow manage to find and disturb it there, the octopus will show you its signature blue rings as a warning signal. And if you don't get the hint, it will introduce you to its other signature feature, a venom a thousand times more powerful than cyanide. One octopus has enough of it to do away with 26 people within minutes. This venom is more toxic than that of land mammals. The octopus normally uses it to hunt crabs, shrimp, and small fish by pecking them with its beak and paralyzing them. The same can happen to a human victim. You'll unlikely even feel the bite until it's too late. The good news is that there have been no known cases of such incidents since the 1960s. If you don't disturb the blue ring octopus, it will never attack you first. If you enjoy picking shells on the beach, Make sure the ones you collect don't belong to a cone snail. It's nothing like its relatives living on land and eating fresh leaves and bark. There are over 500 species of this venomous sea creature, and a few that can really hurt you. These little snails are extremely vicious, just like Jimmy from third grade. They inject their venom through a harpoon-like tooth. The consequences of this injection can be quite terrible for you. Now, are you afraid of snakes? Well, I have some bad news for you. You can't escape them even in the water. Certain kinds of these creatures have adapted to live both on land and in the sea, especially in the warm waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. All the species we know so far are venomous, and sometimes an encounter with them can be super dangerous. The good news is that they only bite if you disturb them. So the safest way to go is in the opposite direction of these slithery sea creatures. Not only venomous sea creatures present a danger to you while you're in the water. Strong earthquakes sometimes cause the formation of massive ocean waves. If they head ashore, they hardly leave anything intact in their way. You know this dangerous sea phenomenon as a tsunami. There is also another type of this natural disaster called a meteo tsunami. They're caused by rapid storm systems and pressure changes above the open water. A powerful storm can generate a whole wall of water. Sometimes, this wall grows several feet high while it moves through a shallow continental shelf, inlets, or bays. If it gets strong enough, it can damage houses close to the water. It's really tricky to forecast or detect a meteor tsunami because it's nearly impossible to tell from a seismic one. It happens much more often than regular tsunamis, especially in the Great Lakes area. Now, the ocean can be dangerous to you, even if you're staying in what seems like safety on the shore. One such unpleasant surprise could be a sneaker wave moving your way. As you can guess from its name, waves like this sneak out on unsuspecting beachgoers. 
They look average, but turn out to be way bigger and more dangerous than you could imagine. Sneaker waves always appear without warning after smaller waves carry huge amounts of water, sand, and gravel. They're so powerful, they can carry swimmers further away into the ocean. They can swipe you off your feet and into the water when you're casually strolling on a jetty or the beach or on an outcropping nearby. Oregon State University researchers found that sneaker waves form in offshore storms that carry wind energy to the ocean surface. With all that energy, several waves unite and overlap into one beast that stands higher and goes further ashore than a regular wave. Another thing that makes them more dangerous is that they're hard to predict. The logic of regular wave formation doesn't work with them. Square waves, looking like a giant chessboard over the ocean, are the reason many people visit the Isle of Ré off the western coast of France. If you visit it, you'll notice plenty of signs warning you to stay away from the water once you notice the unusual pattern. The safest way to observe it is from high up places like nearby lighthouses. If you decide to stay in the water, the strong currents coming from two directions can literally sweep you off your feet. Generally, waves can travel many miles over the surface of the water, depending on local winds and weather. And even on days when the weather seems somewhat calm, storms located elsewhere can send in crashing waves that affect the surrounding calm waters. When waves travel onto the shores of distant lands, they're called swells. This is different from a wave that occurs from the local wind. When two different swells coming from opposite directions meet, it's known as a cross sea. This is what generates these square waves that you see near the Isle of Ray. The cross-sea phenomenon can appear in different locations around the world. The Isle of Ray is one of them, thanks to specific wind and weather patterns that create the perfect storm, which makes this cross-sea so beautiful and well-recognizable. Well, wasn't that swell? Uh, swell? Eh, never mind. Ah, beautiful. You're walking with your friend, and look up at the sky. The sun looks a bit different today. Like it has some kind of ring around it. A rainbow type thing. Huh. Look at that! Your friend pulls his head up out of his phone. You shouldn't look directly at the... Stop everything! He says. It's a sun halo! We need to find shelter now! Unless you have the world's biggest umbrella on you! A sun halo is nature's sign that there's a snow or rainstorm on its way. It's caused by clouds that are made of bazillions of small ice crystals. Sunlight goes through those crystals, which causes the light to split and refract, like when there's a rainbow. Now, don't look at the sun halo directly. It's going to be tempting because it's not something you see every day. Plus, it's really beautiful. But ultraviolet light can burn the exposed tissue of your retina and cause serious damage, so it's not worth it. Grab some sunglasses and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts around 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. In June 2020, what the people were looking at was an anvil cloud, a rare storm formation in the sky. Formed when strong air currents carry water vapor upwards, the air expands and spreads out as it hits the bottom of the stratosphere. It pushes the dense cloud into the cool anvil shape you see. And sometimes it even gets to be a mushroom. Anvil clouds produce some of the most dangerous lightning of all storms. One that's called a bolt out of the blue. This lightning strike seems to magically come out of the blue sky, with the storm being many miles away. This type of bolt comes from the top of the anvil and can be 10 times more powerful than a typical lightning strike. People got so frightened after witnessing a giant cloud that they thought something terrible must have happened. The locals had pictures of the large billow on social media before officials could explain what was going on. Authorities managed to calm everyone's fears by informing them it was nothing more than a natural phenomenon, and a beautiful one at that. Before dissipating, these clouds typically stay in one area, regardless of how strong the wind is. If you look off the western coast of France, you'll see the Isle of Ré. Thanks to its beautiful blue waters, clean sandy beaches, and stunning lighthouses, this place is a very popular vacation spot. 
But perhaps the coolest part about the island of Rei is what you see just beyond the shore. Square waves. This strange wave pattern looks like a giant chessboard over the ocean. Many visitors to the island become captivated by these waves and go to high up places like nearby lighthouses to take pictures of this natural phenomenon. They say that when looking down at these square patterns in the water, it's almost as if there's some sort of metal grid underneath it. And while these wave patterns are truly fascinating, the people who choose to enjoy them from afar are doing it right. They know to stay out of the water. To understand how these square waves come to be, it's important to know how waves occur in the first place. Generally, waves can travel many miles over the surface of the water, depending on local winds and weather. And even on days when the weather seems somewhat calm, storms located elsewhere can send in crashing waves that affect the surrounding calm waters. When waves travel onto the shores of distant lands, they're called swells. This is different from a wave that occurs from local wind. When two different swells coming from opposite directions meet, it's known as a cross sea. This is what generates these square waves you see near the Isle of Ray. While these waves are one of the reasons why people flock to this island, they can still expect to enjoy calm, relaxing waters most of the time. The cross sea only occurs during certain times of the year in specific weather. Plus, it's common knowledge around Ray to steer clear of the ocean when these square waves appear. So it's not often that you hear about anyone getting caught in them because most people know better. And since a lot of people on the island are tourists, there are plenty of signs around warning them to get out of the water during this time. However, not everyone gets the memo. There have been a handful of cases where people got caught in the cross sea, but thankfully and luckily, they managed to get out safely. These square waves have become somewhat famous over time, given that there's really no other place in the world that boasts a cross sea like this one. In fact, no one has ever spotted square waves anywhere but the island of Ray. However, there are swells that can be found throughout the oceans in the world, and a cross sea can take place. But if the angle they approach each other at is more shallow, the wave may actually look like it's coming from the same direction, even when it's not. Not to mention, swells can slowly lose momentum as they drift further and further away. So their crest, or the top of the wave, appears more round and less jagged. The Island of Ray's specific wind and weather patterns are literally the perfect storm and create a cross sea that people can clearly recognize. It's 2009 in Italy. A man was hanging out in his kitchen. Then he saw some flickering lights. He knew just what to do. He moved his family to a safe place. A couple of seconds later, a massive earthquake hit the whole region. His family survived thanks to his quick reaction. He knew these flickering lights were actually a sign of an upcoming earthquake. People have been seeing these mysterious lights for ages. Some thought it was some kind of sign coming from space. Scientists never used to take them seriously, but after the invention of photography, more and more evidence of these strange lights appeared. Soon, they realized the connection. The lights appear, and pretty soon, the earthquake hits. After a bit of digging around, they actually found some records of these earthquake lights from hundreds of years ago. There were bluish flames coming out of the ground right before an earthquake. Oh, creepy. The Christmas Island Crab is part of an amazing phenomenon once a year. Their migration period is determined by the phase of the moon and the first rainfall between October and February although the precise date can't be predicted. Once the crabs have been prompted, they leave their homes amongst the forest and migrate in massive hordes towards the sea. Numbering in millions, a sea of red crabs is observed as they make their journey across the island, creating roadblocks and making their way to the ocean. There, they lay their eggs and then make their trek back, returning to the forest until the next year. There are bridges in the Indian state of Meghalaya that are created entirely of living tree roots. The bridges are made up of tangled thick roots that are strong enough to hold over 50 people at a time. 
The Kasi and Jaintia tribes became masters in the art of growing these insane bridges. They need them to cross the streams below with ease. Some of these root bridges are over 180 years old. To make them, the members of the tribes care for the roots until they grow long enough to reach the opposite bank. It can take as long as 10 to 15 years to grow a bridge. In the process, the roots become tightly entwined with one another. This is how the bridges get so strong. And once a bridge is fully grown, it can last for over 500 years. While some roots decay, new ones are continually growing. That's why the unusual natural constructions last so long. Light pillars are colorful beams of light that either jet up from Earth towards the sky or shine down from the clouds. Usually, they only occur in cold temperatures as they form when the sunlight gets reflected off ice crystals floating in the air. The higher the crystals are in the air, the taller these bright and colorful pillars become. They're most common at sunrise and sunset. There are hidden caves all over the world that are filled with glowing light. This light comes from hundreds of glow worms that have made a cozy home in the caves. Some of the caves are more than 30 million years old, and most of them can be found in New Zealand and Australia. The worms themselves don't actually glow, but baby worms, called larvae, form silk strings made out of mucus. These strings form nets. It's these nets that can illuminate the entire cave. Their purpose is to attract flies and other tasty insects for the glowworms to munch on. Rainbow trees are 100% a real thing. Hailing from the Philippines and Indonesia, these colorful wonders are called rainbow eucalyptus, or rainbow gum. The rainbow hues are created by the contrast in colors of old and new bark. As the thin surface layers of bark peel away, they reveal newer ones with brighter, more eye-catching colors. The brand new bark is green, then it changes to purple, then red, and finally brown. This is because the trees contain a substance called chlorophyll. It makes the bark green. As each strip of bark ages, it loses chlorophyll and slowly changes its color. To build an underwater structure, you'll need some interesting engineering. A large bridge over a river or bay has its foundation rooted underwater. It's even more complicated with undersea tunnels. Underwater construction is challenging. Engineers need to deal with water pressure and corrosion from salt water. There's also a problem of finding suitable materials. The most typical of them are concrete, steel, and acrylic glass. Concrete doesn't care about water currents and doesn't get damaged by salt water. Steel provides underwater constructions with a strong structure. And acrylic glass is tough, long-lasting, and resistant to sunlight. It's also transparent. That's why it's often used to make windows in underwater buildings. Anyway, when the water is shallow, it's not that hard to build something there. Constructors create a temporary foundation. Then, on top of it, they build several piers supporting the upper structure. But if the waters are deep, engineers have to use other methods. Depending on which one they choose, water is either extracted or diverted during the construction process. One such method involves using a set of large driven piles. Those are long, thin columns made mostly of steel, but their interior is partially hollow. With the help of a huge hammer, they get driven into the waterbed, like nails are driven into a piece of wood. After that, these steel columns get filled with concrete through a special tube. The concrete displaces the water that was in the pile before. Concrete has the ability to set even when it's surrounded by water. That's why driven piles eventually turn into a stable foundation for overwater and underwater constructions. Driven piles are a very cost-effective way of building something that has to be fixed in place. They prevent things from being moved by the water current. Another way to build underwater structures is coffer dams. They are built temporarily and allow workers to create a dry space for the construction. The water gets pumped out of this enclosure and the coffer dam works like a dam. A completed coffer dam looks like a massive pit with high walls surrounded by water. Coffer dams are made of rocks, steel, and even dirt. These constructions can be built fast and removed even faster. But the process of putting up a coffer dam is complicated and challenging for engineers. They have to make sure the structure won't flood or collapse. The simplest way to build a coffer dam is to pile up loads of dirt. But in this case, workers usually have to somehow make the construction stronger. It helps to protect it from the damage caused by water. Once the coffer dam is ready, 
pumps extract the water from its interior. Sometimes, it's too expensive to build a very deep and strong coffer dam. In this case, constructors use several powerful pumps that get rid of excess water when it seeps through the coffer dam walls. If a coffer dam starts to fail, this process is slow and, luckily, predictable. On the construction site, there are not only main but also backup pumps. In case of emergency, they can kick into overdrive. Then, the water is kept out for the time the personnel needs to evacuate. Coffer dams are most often used during the construction of dams and bridges. But when a large ship, like a modern cruise liner, needs to be repaired, engineers use coffer dams too. Such vessels are too massive to be hauled ashore, and a coffer dam makes a perfect dry lock. The ship gets isolated from the water, and mechanics can repair it wherever it sits. Also, when a cruise ship needs to be expanded, engineers construct a coffer dam around it. Then they pump out all the water from the inside, creating a dry working place. The ship gets cut into two parts, and the process of its lengthening begins. There are several main types of coffer dams – braced, cellular, rock-filled, or earthen. For each of them, engineers need to figure out the best depth at which the wall should be put into the ground. It depends on the type of soil and the water reservoir itself. Braced coffer dams are mostly used during shallow water construction. Such a structure is actually a wall of sheet piles. Those are parts with interlocking edges. Usually, they're made of steel, but the material can also be reinforced concrete or timber. Sheet piles create something like a box around the needed area. Cellular coffer dams are also made of sheet piles, but in this case, the piles have a special shape. After being connected, they form cells that get filled with soil or clay. The cells, in turn, create a watertight wall. Thanks to its structure, it's exceptionally stable. Rock-filled coffer dams are used when there's a lot of rock at the construction site. They're built over the soil. This prevents the water from seeping into the coffer dam, and the rocks serve as reinforcement. Earthen coffer dams are built in areas where the water is less than 10 feet deep. They're created from the materials that are at hand – clay, sand, and even soil. There are also single-walled and double-walled coffer dams. The first type is used when the area of the construction isn't large and the depth is more than 20 feet. Such coffer dams are typically necessary for building bridges. Timber or wooden sheets are put into the sea or riverbed. After that, iron or steel sheets are added on the inside. On both sides of the wall, workers place half-filled bags of sand. Finally, the water gets pumped out and the coffer dam is ready for use. The double-walled coffer dam is used for large construction areas and when the water is very deep. Such construction sites need more powerful supports. This stronger coffer dam has two walls, which provides it with extra stability. Two piles get pushed into the waterbed with some space in between. The deeper it is, the bigger the space between the walls. Then they get attached to each other. After that, this space gets filled with soil. Coffer dams aren't cheap. This means that if one is used for a project, there are no other available options. For example, it's the best way to construct permanent dams. When the Hoover Dam was built, several coffer dams were put up to divert the water from the Colorado River. As soon as the project is finished, the water is pumped back into the coffer dam, and its walls, whatever they are, get removed. One more way of underwater construction is caissons. They're watertight structures that are put into the water. Even open, they remain dry inside. Workers can keep digging down until they reach some solid surface. That's where the caisson will be placed upon. What's so different about caissons is that they eventually become parts of the foundation for, let's say, a bridge or a dam. And even though you might not think of a bridge or a dam as an underwater construction, most of their crucial elements are underwater. For example, a large bridge wouldn't be able to hold its weight without massive supporting towers, and they stand in the water. There are several types of caissons, open, pneumatic, and box. Open caissons have no bottom. They're actually just vertical walls that allow builders to dig at the bottom of them. Pneumatic caissons keep the water from seeping through by using compressed air. This helps to maintain equal pressure inside and outside the construction. When workers dig out some materials, these get sent up through a special muck tube. When the caisson reaches the bedrock, workers fill it with concrete. Unlike others, a box caisson has a floor, and workers lower it onto a foundation that is constructed in advance. During the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge, engineers used two massive caissons. Thanks to them, they reached the bedrock and created the foundation for the towers of the bridge. And then there's also off-site construction. 
that's when things are not only built but also assembled away from the site. In this case, engineers often use modular construction. That's when factory-produced building units are delivered to the site. There, they get assembled, like a giant Lego set. Structures are then usually floated to the site on huge barges, or they get towed there. After that, they're lowered in place. Some sink under their own weight. Others can only reach the seafloor after getting loaded with additional weights. This method of construction is rather expensive, and still, it's much more cost-effective than building right underwater. The latter needs skilled engineers and unique tools, and don't forget about the risks. But what about underwater tunnels? How on earth are they constructed? Modern tunnels are usually built with the help of massive tunnel boring machines. They even have a nickname, moles. Even though such a mechanism has an exorbitant price, several million dollars, it needs little time to create a long tunnel. The machine moves forward very slowly. It has a special circular plate with rotating disc cutters. They can easily chew through solid rock. The rock is then dropped onto an outboard conveyor belt. Another mechanism uses this rock to construct the tunnel's lining in the mole's wake. This way, the mole not only excavates the tunnel, but also reinforces the walls that will later support it. This method, and 11 huge tunnel boring machines, was used to build the 32-mile-long channel tunnel. And the whole process took only three years. Cut and cover is another method of creating a tunnel underwater. First, workers dig a trench in the ocean floor or riverbed. Then, they put concrete or steel tubes there, made in advance. After the tubes get covered with a thick layer of rock, the sections are connected. All workers have to do is pump out the water. That's how the Ted Williams Tunnel, connecting Logan Airport with South Boston, was built. There, they used 12 enormous steel tubes, more than 300 feet each. And the tubes contained already fully constructed roads. Now, the Mariana Trench is the deepest and probably the most enigmatic place on Earth, whatever that means. Bizarre creatures, such as deep-sea anglerfish, frilled and goblin sharks, barrel-eyed fish, hatchet fish, ooh, live in a crescent-shaped trench in the Western Pacific. Just three people have ever descended down the Challenger Deep in the southern end of the Mariana Trench. There, at a depth of almost 11,000 feet, Vents are bubbling up carbon dioxide and liquid sulfur. Mud volcanoes erupt under the pressure a thousand times greater than at the surface. And so, it's no place I want to go. So bye! Get back in there. Alright, alright. Since you clicked, yeah, you're about to visit places no less mysterious and creepy than the Mariana Trench. Your first stop is Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula to be precise. See those bottomless sinkholes filled with crystal-clear water? It's fresh water that overlies salt water seeping from the sea. The sinkholes are called cenotes. The Mayans believe these natural wells were the gateways to the underworld. Thousands of cenotes created by collapsed limestone bedrock form one of the world's longest underwater cave systems. You can easily get lost in this tangled, mysterious network. Now it's time to visit the Caribbean. There, you'll get to a depth of almost 8,000 feet to see the Von Damme vent field. The hydrothermal vents fire out streams of muddy, scalding water with a temperature reaching 400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's almost enough to bake a pizza. These mounds are made of talc, a substance you can find in baby powder. The Von Damme vent field is an oasis for odd species. One of those is kind of a creepy shrimp without eyes. Instead, they're equipped with patches of light-sensitive cells on their backs. Now, you don't have to travel far away. The next enigma on your list is also in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there is a giant sinkhole. It's also blue. Yep, that's the Great Blue Hole. The thing is about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave until rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it becomes. You see tons of stalactite-filled caves, but don't even try to enter them unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you notice the water shimmer. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. Time to get out of there! Who knows what you might come across in the murky depths? 
your next destination is off the Pacific Northwest coast. Almost 500 streams of methane bubbles were discovered there several years ago. Because of the bubbles, the vents got the name Champagne Seeps, which sounds better than the fart spas. Scientists are still puzzling over this phenomenon. Where does the methane come from? Underwater cows? Why is its temperature warmer than that of the surrounding ocean? And most importantly, what would happen if you managed to light a match somewhere near a large bubble? Methane is a highly flammable gas, and setting a methane bubble on fire… well, you get the picture. And now, you're off to Iceland. The plan is to dive into Silfra, a fissure filled with pure glacier water. This 206-foot deep crack is the only underwater place on the planet where you can touch two continents at once. The deeper you go, the darker it becomes. The rocky landscape looks otherworldly. Divers who dare to visit this incredible place risk having their gear frozen, getting hypothermia, or not surviving whatsoever. After all, the water temperature in Silfra Fisher is about 35 degrees Fahrenheit year-round. Your next destination is Scotland. Okay, cue the bagpipes. If you dive in the Gulf of Corryvreckan, a narrow strait between two islands, you'll see massive underwater rocks and deep holes. They create the third largest permanent whirlpool on the planet, the Corryvreckan Maelstrom. The water moves through the strait at breakneck speed. It hits the underwater rocks, and the place looks like a pot with boiling water. The waves created in the process sometimes reach a height of 15 feet, and you can still hear the roaring whirlpool from 10 miles away. It's believed the Corryvreckan maelstrom has swallowed dozens of sailors over the centuries. They were caught unaware by the ferocity of this natural phenomenon and pulled underwater in the blink of an eye. Okay, enough bagpipes. Your adventures are getting more and more extreme. You're heading for Antarctica. There, in the Southern Ocean, you'll find the Ross Sea Ice Shelf. Say that five times real fast. Later, not now. It's roughly the size of Spain, with the ocean underneath containing as much water as the North Sea. Once, scientists drilled all the way down through this enormous chunk of ice. Imagine their astonishment when they found life in those extreme conditions. The researchers came across dozens of mysterious species not known before. The most unnerving were upside-down swimming fish and overturned sea anemones hanging in the frigid waters. Hopefully, bizarre places with a notorious reputation don't frighten you. Well, too bad, because you're about to visit the Bermuda Triangle. It's an area between Bermuda, Florida, and Puerto Rico where planes and ships seem to vanish in thin air. For the first time, this place attracted a lot of attention in 1945. That's when five U.S. Navy planes disappeared during training. Before radio contact was lost, the flight leader said, We're entering white water. Nothing seems right. After that, the planes with 14 men flying them disappeared. Even scarier, a rescue plane with 13 people on board never came back as well. Some people believe the mythical city of Atlantis lies at the bottom of the triangle. They claim its inhabitants use extraterrestrial technologies to sink ships and crash airplanes. Others blame rare and unexplored natural phenomena, for example, magnetic anomalies, or massive pockets of flammable methane gas. There we go again. Then, if a bolt of lightning ignited a giant methane bubble near a ship or a plane, this could probably make it sink without a trace. Except the smell. But methane is found everywhere all over the world, and it never behaves this way. Some experts aren't sure there's a mystery to explain whatsoever. Lots of busy routes pass through this area. No wonder more ships and planes sink there than anywhere else. Now, prepare some warm clothes. You're heading for the north again. Your destination is Cape Desolation in Greenland. Nice place. In 2012, Canadian researchers were sampling the water in that area, and their equipment came back to the surface with pieces of coral attached to it. That's how a cold-water coral reef was stumbled across. These unique pinkish corals can easily go without sunlight and live in strong currents 3,000 feet below the surface. Another unique spot you can't miss lies between Greenland and Siberia. 
The Gakko Ridge is the deepest and most remote portion of the global mid-ocean ridge system. In some places, it reaches the depth of more than 3 miles. It's only natural the darkest corners of this underwater world remain unexplored. Fascinating chemical reactions happening at the bottom of the ridge produce hot fluids rich in minerals. They spew, like freshmen at a rush party, from seafloor vents. And since these vents are isolated from the rest of the ocean, they're hot spots for bizarre creatures found nowhere else in the world. Your next stop is just off the coast of Cuba. Circular columns, paved floors, symmetrical stone structures. That's what the Cuban underwater city looks like. What happened there? Why was a large city abandoned at a depth of more than 2,000 feet? Lots of people believe those are the ruins of a long-forgotten civilization. But scientists have their doubts. They claim the lost city is nothing but a natural phenomenon that appeared about 5 million years ago. The disk and donut structures often appear around the areas of the seafloor where natural gases break free. Again with the gases. When you come to visit the Sargasso Sea in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean, you won't find its shores. Instead, it's surrounded by powerful ocean currents. These are the same currents that turn the sea into a gigantic convention for dense brown seaweed. In the 19th century, a French ship was discovered in the Sargasso Sea. Its sails were set, but not a single crew member was on board. This mysterious disappearance made people believe the seaweed was carnivorous. The Sargasso Sea is indeed a weird place. It's always eerily calm and unnaturally warm, even though it's surrounded by the churning, freezing waters of the Atlantic Ocean. Could one of these bizarre places become a home to the largest marine predator ever, the Megalodon? The giant shark's teeth, some larger than an adult man's hand, have been found pretty much all over the world. But since these creatures preferred warm, shallow waters, they lived along the coastlines of all continents except Antarctica. In other words, it'd be a waste of time to search for the giant predator in the depths of the Mariana Trench, in Greenland, or in Mexican cenotes. But then, could it choose the waters of the Caribbean to hide from the hustle and bustle of the modern world? Eh, don't get your hopes up. There's been no proof the Megalodon does exist these days. It wasn't a shy, elusive animal, and still, no one has seen this shark lurking around recently. Not even near the fart spas. Well, you're taking a cool dip in the sea late one summer evening when out of nowhere, the water starts glowing. You're not in some fantastical dream, and this is no time to stop and enjoy the beauty. Get out of there now, because you're not alone. You look at a map and clearly see bodies of water are supposed to be blue. Though, when you scoop up some in a glass, any water, if it's clean, is mostly clear. So, how is that? Well, you probably recall learning about Roy G. Biv in school. The colors of the visible light spectrum you can clearly see in rainbows. Well, ponds, rivers, lakes, and oceans look blue because all that water spread over a large enough surface area will absorb the red part of the light spectrum. What's left to reflect off the surface and beeline straight into our eyes? Cool tones of blue, some greens, and purples. But under the right circumstances, some bodies of water can break all those laws of physics and what we've accepted as reality. Like Australia's Gippsland Lakes, which glow electric blue at night. The waves light up as they break into the shore, and it's breathtaking to see against a black starry sky. But get rid of the romance, switch to day mode and look again. The water is a rusty red-orange. It's called a red tide. It happens because of a type of single-celled organism called dinoflagellates, also known as sea sparkles or red algae. Unusually large blooms of them can grow when temperatures are a bit higher, the seas are calm, and there are more nutrients in the water, often after a storm or natural catastrophe. You see big blotches of red in the water during the day, but at night, They light up like a lava lamp. This happens because organisms glow when they're stressed or disturbed. 
Scientists think this evolutionary trick helps the algae scare off enemies or attract the things that eat their predators. Waves moving in the water can trigger the chemical reaction in them that makes them light up. But don't try it for yourself by swimming in a patch of sea sparkles. Red algae can be hazardous to people and marine life. For one, they contain high levels of ammonia. So a peaceful swim in glowing waters can mean eye irritation and rash. They can also make the surrounding air difficult to breathe. What's worse, fish and marine mammals that dine on them may find themselves having their last meal. They make seafood toxic, so eating something that ate red algae can bring about symptoms like food poisoning in people. In rare cases, it can even affect the central nervous system, causing tingling, loss of motor control, or even respiratory paralysis. Yeah, you probably want to avoid that. Sometimes, a glowing danger can sneak up on you in perfectly blue waters. Crystal jellies live off the North American coast of the Pacific Ocean and glow purplish blue and green. And an unexpected rendezvous with these bioluminescent beauties can bring you nothing but a big red itchy rash. The good news is that its sting isn't that painful. Now, no need to pinch yourself. That bubblegum pink lake is real. And it's not the only one in the world. But Australia's Lake Hillier is the most mysterious. The water is extremely salty there, but some microorganisms still manage to thrive. Salt-loving algae and pink bacteria are what give the lake its unearthly look. What makes it so unique among all the world's pink salt lakes is that when you scoop the water up in a glass, it doesn't lose the color. It's actually safe to swim in, though you couldn't if you wanted to. It's closed off from the public. Plus, the saltiness would dry your skin out and irritate it. And this is no strawberry milkshake, so don't even think about drinking it. It's 10 times saltier than the sea, and drinking ocean water is dangerous enough. The crater lake on Kawa Ijen, an active volcano in Java, will astound you with its turquoise water. Well, if you can call it water, this thing is a lake of sulfuric acid. Now, a quick recap of the pH scale. Toward zero is acidic, like lemons, seven is neutral, pure water, and alkalines are closer to 14. Think bleach and drain cleaner. The water in this lake has a pH of less than 0.3, making it a hair less acidic than battery acid. Keep your distance while enjoying the beauty, and just wait until the real show starts at night. The volcano spews electric blue lava. Technically, it's the sulfuric gases catching on fire from the lava and being exposed to oxygen. Yellowstone has blue lava too, but it's also where you'll find the grand prismatic spring. The thing looks like a melted rainbow. The center is the hottest part. No color-changing bacteria can live there, so it reflects typical blue. Now around that is a band of yellow. The water there is farther from the heat center, so it allows for bacteria that produce carotenoids as a type of natural sunscreen. This pigment chemical is actually orange. It's what gives carrots their hue, by the way. But the green-colored bacteria make it look a bit yellowish. The next ring is orange. The water there is somewhat cooler. And it houses four different types of microorganisms that make the water bright orange, rusty red orange, and even brown. Boiling Lake in Dominica could probably cook an egg. The bubbling water is grayish-blue and hides under a huge vapor cloud. The average temperature near the shore is between 180 and 197 degrees Fahrenheit. In the center, it's still unknown. No one's measured the temperature there because the water's always boiling. It's also hard to breathe out there because of volcanic sulfur gases. New Zealand's frying pan lake will make your eyes water for several reasons. First, you'll be astonished by its majestic beauty. But that's not a fairy tale mist floating above the surface. It's hazardous vapors that'll really get the tears flowing. It's the world's largest hot spring and is a bit less acidic than a lemon. The water is about 130 degrees and you can feel its heat from a football field away. But that's not enough to cause these bubbles, you see. 
No, this lake's not boiling. That's carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide gases bubbling up and breaking through the surface. So, what you have is a massive 9-acre steaming cauldron spewing poisonous fumes. You can safely assume it's no place for swimming. Out-of-this-world colors caused by toxic microorganisms, steaming and boiling volcanic lakes. Most dangerous waters will clearly let you know to keep your distance. Except for riptides. A riptide is a water current that carries you far away from the shore, and they can happen unexpectedly. If you ever get caught in one, stay calm and swim parallel to the beach to break free from it, and know what to look for to avoid them. You can sometimes see a darker, calm section between the whitecaps of breaking waves. Rip currents can also pull debris like algae, seaweed, and sand quickly away from the shore, while the surrounding waves usually bring them toward it. Hey, let's be careful out there! Check out the cool map of New Orleans, USA. See those bold gray lines around the city? Those are levees keeping the city safe from the red flood coming in from Lake Morapas, Lake Salvador, and Little Lake. Without those levees, New Orleans would be in big trouble with rising sea levels. Even with the levees, the damage looks pretty bad. The Bilancy and Jean Lafitte Wildlife Preserve look like they're almost underwater on the map. New Orleans is not the only city in the U.S. that's at risk of going underwater. The city of Savannah is located right in the middle of Hurricane Central. But even without Mother Nature's fury, the place is facing some serious sea level rise. The Savannah River to the north and the Ogeechee River to the south might both overflow into the surrounding marshland. And that's not even the worst part. By 2050, there may be massive floods every year that will make history books look boring. Sorry to break it to you, but Miami is on the line too. The Sunshine State is shelling out around $4 billion to stop things from getting worse, especially in Miami Beach, a hotspot for tourists. As of now, over 1,200 houses are at risk of flooding. The Big Apple is also getting hit with more and more crazy floods. In November 2021, they even had their first ever flash flood emergency. But still, the city is not ready for it at all. Even the Statue of Liberty, one of the most famous spots in NYC, got messed up in Hurricane Sandy. Now with sea levels rising, Lady Liberty is in danger once again. Tabasco, Mexico is no stranger to flooding, thanks to its coastal location on the Gulf of Mexico. This low, flat state is covered in wetlands and forests and already deals with seasonal floods. But with sea levels rising, it could eventually be completely taken over by water. This would put at risk some seriously important things, like the Mayan ruins of Malpasito and Comacalco and Tabasco sauce. Ah, sorry, the sauce comes from Louisiana. Jokes aside, it's not just Tabasco. Parts of the Yucatan Peninsula and Baja California are also at risk from rising sea levels. Panama City is also in trouble. Apparently, the super trendy Casco Viejo and the swanky Costa del Este hood might get submerged in 2050, when Pedro Arias de Avila first founded it. Fun fact, it was the first European settlement on the Pacific coast. The 17th and 18th century forts on the Caribbean side are also in danger. According to Climate Central, they might get washed away by rising sea levels. Even UNESCO has had them on its risk list since 2012. Some more sad news. The Bahamas is going to be hit hard by rising sea levels. I mean, Hurricane Dorian was already a huge bummer in 2019. And now, they're saying most of Grand Bahama, Nassau, Abaco, and Spanish Wells could go underwater by 2050 due to various reasons. Amsterdam. The Netherlands is one of the low countries for a reason. The city and its buddies Rotterdam and Den Haag sit low and close to the North Sea. You gotta hand it to the Dutch though. They know how to handle the water and keep it at bay with high-tech flood defenses.
With sea levels constantly on the rise, it looks like their impressive system of dikes, dams, barriers, levees, and floodgates is going to get even more crucial in the future. Still, despite all the effort, some experts are afraid that the Venice of the North might go underwater by 2030. Well, this one is not something you would expect, but still. Venice is sinking by 2 millimeters every year, and the sea levels are rising. This means that the city is getting flooded more often, and it's only going to get worse because of climate change. Just like New Orleans, Venice has a flood defense system, but as the crisis gets worse, it's going to be harder and more expensive to keep it going. Even worse, beautiful St. Mark's Basilica has already been hit hard by flooding. They tried to introduce a flood barrier system, but even that didn't work out perfectly. In 2020, the flood barrier was not used and St. Mark's Square got majorly damaged. Looks like even when we try to prevent the effects of climate change, things don't always go according to plan. In London, rising sea levels are causing more flooding along the Thames estuary, and it's not looking good. Areas along the River Thames are especially at risk, putting iconic buildings like the Tower of London and the House of Parliament as well as cultural hotspots like the Tate Modern and Shakespeare's Globe in Jeopardy. And the British Museum? It has so much precious stuff, even Gollum would be jealous. We just can't let it go underwater. During your next Euro trip, make sure to add Bruges in Belgium to your list. Chances are you won't see it if you skip it this time. The thing is, it's also in danger of getting flooded. Bruges is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so we really hope they can protect it from any potential floods. Plus, it has a lot of nice local specialties we don't want to lose. You may not know it, but Andalusia in Spain is home to Western Europe's oldest city, Cadiz. It's been around for over 3,000 years thanks to the Phoenicians. But unfortunately, climate change is putting it at risk. Rising sea levels might flood the city's cobbled stone center, beautiful tree-lined plazas, and historic sea fortifications. And it's not just Cadiz. Parts of Andalusia are in danger of flooding too. Well, seems like one more destination must be added to your bucket list. Ho Chi Minh City and especially its eastern marshy districts are at risk, just like all the other places mentioned before. And it looks like the whole city is going to have a tough time with the Mekong Delta. While the main part of the city probably won't be completely submerged by 2030, flooding and storms are definitely going to become a big problem. So, it turns out that Bangkok might be in some hot water due to global warming. Literally, a 2020 study says that Bangkok could be one of the cities most dramatically affected by rising sea levels. It's sitting pretty low at just 5 feet above sea level. And to make things even more interesting, it's sinking at a speedy rate of an inch per year. And the cherry on top? The soil it's built on is super dense clay, which means it's basically a flood magnet. By 2030, parts of Bangkok, including the main airport, might have to get used to living underwater. The next city at risk is Kolkata, India. The fertile land in West Bengal has been a major key to their success for ages, but now it's causing some big worries in Kolkata and the surrounding areas. Just like Ho Chi Minh City, they could have some serious problems with all that rain during monsoon season. And the map of what could happen in 2100 is pretty scary stuff. The next destination is Shanghai, China. It's literally translated as the city on the sea but it might actually end up under the sea. Climate control data is flashing red warning lights for this megacity, making it one of China's most at-risk cities. The Yangtze Delta, where Shanghai sits, and the Pearl River Delta, home to the Guangzhou, are both in hot water too, with lots of people living on low-lying land that might get flooded. The Maldives, a luxurious group of islands, already get flooded every year. Experts think they might lose 80 or even more percent of their islands in the next 30 years. The Maldivian authorities aren't taking any chances though. They're already making plans to buy land in other countries, just in case they need to relocate the whole population. 